I come from Vienna, so I had a very, very far ride. I took a two-hour train ride. Um, and I'm here today to talk about styling component-based systems. Um, I work on a project called Spectrum, which is a platform for online communities. If you imagine a mixture between Slack and a forum, um, I made it because I needed a place for my open source project's communities to go, and there wasn't really a good solution. Um, so that's where Spectrum comes from. I want to start by telling you a little story. In October 2016, I was on the other side of the planet, in Australia. And I was there for some friends, and I went out with a friend of mine called Sharky, and he showed me this really um, shady, hidden whiskey bar, which apparently serves some of the best whiskey in the world. It's called Uncle Ming's, I think. And so you go down into this this stair, unmarked stairwell, and then you go through red curtains and into this really dark cellar room, and there's a bar, and they sell you really good Chinese food like dumplings and tempura, and some of the best whiskey you can get on the planet, apparently. Um, I have no idea about whiskey, so I just went with Sharky there. And then Sharky said, another friend of mine is also coming into whiskey. And I said, well, that's, that's nice. And then eventually that friend came, and that friend was Glenn Matter. If you know Glenn, He's one of the creators of CSS modules. And I'd never met Glenn before. And of course, him being the creator of CSS modules, I started talking to him about CSS. Obviously, because what else do you talk to him about, right? Um, and the thing was that at the time, the company I was at, we were building this component library with React called Elemental UI. But the problem was that we built it with less, which meant that anybody who used that component library had to also have less configured, right? Because we shipped less files and you had to compile them somehow. So that was not very ideal because we wanted people to ju just be able to use our button. We didn't want them to have to add Webpack to the setup if they weren't using it. We didn't want them to have to add the less loader to the setup if they didn't want to use less, right? That didn't make any sense. And so we'd, we'd been thinking about this problem for a while but hadn't really arrived at a good solution. On top of that, we wanted the components to be reskinnable. Right? We wanted people to be able to quickly just change the entire color scheme, for example, to make it fit their application. That also wasn't possible because even though we used less variables throughout the entire CSS, people who, use, who NPM installed that component library couldn't change those variables. Right? They were hard-coded in our own files, and they couldn't really change them unless they vendored it in, which nobody ever did because that's annoying. And so we'd been thinking about this problem for a while, and I thought, talked to Glenn about it, and Glenn said, well, have you heard about this thing called CSS and JavaScript? And we'd internally discussed using CSS and JavaScript for a bit, but it wasn't very appealing. It just sounds like the stupidest idea I'd ever heard. <laughs> Honestly, like, who would put CSS into JavaScript, right? Those are two separate languages. Why would you ever do that? <laughs> That's what I get class for? Ah, oh, of course, of course. But when you think about it, it will make everything much easier, because you can publish CSS in JavaScript to NPM. And when people use our button, they don't have to care about how specifically to include our CSS into their setup, right? CSS in JavaScript takes care of injecting it automatically. Um, so that was great. And on top of that, it's dynamic. So theoretically, we should easily be able to add theming to our components that could be changed at runtime if people wanted to. The problem was that none of the existing libraries that did CSS in JavaScript were great. Um, and I don't mean to um, put those people down because there, were, th there was a ton of experimentation going on, and the people who built those libraries did a really good job, just not fit our own needs, right? They all let you write CSS as JavaScript objects, which I hate that, honestly. I don't want to write my CSS as JavaScript objects. I like CSS. I like writing CSS. I don't want to force that into JavaScript. It doesn't make any sense. But so Glenn and I talked about it, and we arrived at the conclusion that probably CSS and JavaScript is the way to go for that, because we really wanted it to be able to sh be shareable with everybody who wanted to use our component library, and we also really needed theming. And then we talked a bit more about components, right? And components, they, they have this really interesting mm, property of hiding implementation details. And I want to explain to you what I mean with that, right? If you imagine a button component, now, this is using React syntax, but it could be any component JavaScript framework you want to use, right? If you have a button component, there's really, there could be any number of states your button component could be, right? In, in our case, for example, we could have three. Your standard button, 
a primary button because sometimes you need a bigger button because something is more important, and the disabled button, right? And as you can see, those states of our component change the HTML that is generated, right? If you want to make it disabled, you have to set the type to disabled because otherwise people could still click on it. Um, if you, it, you always have to change the class name so that it looks bigger or it looks disabled. And this is using BEM syntax, but again, that could be any class name you want. Um, but if you think about it in a component-based systems, all of those attributes, the class names and the types, they're really implementation details, right? The only person they're important for is the creator of the component. If you create a button component, you have to worry about which specific type does that button tag have, you know? Which label does it have? How do people pass it text? Which class name does it have? But once you made that component and people can use it, you re it really looks more like this, right? You just render a button, a primary button, or a disabled button. As the user of a component, you don't actually care which specific class names it attaches. You don't actually care which type it attaches, right? I just want to have a disabled button, and that should do the right thing by default. I shouldn't have to worry about it as the user of a component. In the React community, that led to a, in, an, an interesting development, because people started using components that were solely for styling, that didn't do anything except basically wrap around a tag with a class name. These are sometimes referred to style components, but there's really no name for that pattern, no standardized name for that pattern. What I mean is, if you think about a grid system, right? traditionally you would have a div class name equals row. And then you would have a div class name equals call dash five, for example, if you wanted to have five columns. Um, and you would use these class names throughout your application. So what people in the React community, and we especially in our project, started doing is wrapping these divs in their own components. So suddenly, you had a row component, and you had a column component, and you would use those components throughout your app. The benefit of that is that you could change the implementation at any point, right? I could switch from floats to flexbox to CSS grid without the users of the component ever having to know that I even switched. Right? They wouldn't care because they're still just rendering rows and columns. They don't care what that class name does, which class name it applies. They don't, they, have, they don't have to care about any of that. They just render a row and some columns, and that's it. So Glenn and I talked about all of these things, and we talked about you know, CSS modules and CSS and JavaScript, and we realized that maybe, just maybe, it makes sense to always do styling at the component level. And that was really the first big breakthrough we had, right? The first time we both went, wait a second, we could do things differently, right? There could be a different way of doing things. So we thought about how could we make that work, right? Where, where, do, we, where do we go from there? How do you move styling to the component level? What does that even mean? And so we, we, the next day, we sat next to each other in, in, in a shared office and just had our laptops open and typed out possible APIs for this library we were going to maybe create potentially, right? And what we arrived at, sort of a first idea, would look something like this. You said, const component equals element div, and then somehow you were going to add styles, right? Nobody, we didn't know what that looked like yet, but essentially you would always bind your styles to a DOM node and then reuse that component throughout your application. Like a grid component, for example, would render a div with some, a uh, column component would render a div with some styles that made it a column, or a row component, for example. Then we started thinking about this, this thing of putting styles into JavaScript, because we really didn't want to write styles as JavaScript object. That was just extremely unappealing to us. We had designers who knew how to write CSS, and we didn't want to have to teach them JavaScript just to do, do the things they'd been doing for years already. Right? They know how to CSS. They know how to write CSS. So the second big breakthrough we had is that we figured out, what if we put actual CSS into JavaScript? What if we let people write actual CSS like they're used to in JavaScript? And what that looked like initially was something like this, right? You said const component equals lmdiff and then some styles. And what that would generate is a component that when rendered, renders a div tag with the styles color blue attached. Now, it's important to note that we didn't attach this as inline styles. CSS in JavaScript has nothing to do with inline styles. Instead, what we do is we take that string of CSS and we inject it in a style tag in the head of the DOM. 
That means, theoretically, you would be able to use media queries, um, pseudo selectors, pseudo elements, everything CSS does, this does too. At least that was the plan. And so we, this is pretty much where we ended the first day, right? We had this sort of API, and Glenn said, I'm going to go home, and overnight I'm going to hack up a first prototype and see if we can make it work. And the next day he came back and he showed me an API that looked like this, right? And this was sort of a small synthetic difference, right? If you think about it, the syntax is almost the same between those two versions. The important difference is that this is using tagged template literals. Now, tag template literals were introduced into JavaScript uh, in ES uh, 2015. So they're a very new JavaScript feature. But essentially, those backticks that you see are just calling another function, right? So those are like any function you call, you can also call with backticks. And there's some differences in how the function who receives the string actually um, can handle the arguments, which was very important for the next point, which is that we realized we could use functions for conditional styling. Now, that wasn't obvious, because in the first API, in this API, if you were to put a function into this template string, that function would get stringified, and suddenly, you, in, in the middle of your CSS, you would have a literal function, right? Just a JavaScript code, which is totally useless. Like, who needs that, anyway? That's totally useless. But the, the nice thing about tag template literals is that if you put a function in here, that function, we actually get that function, and we can call it which means we can do this, where we pass you the properties in that function, and then you can change your styling based on the properties passed to the component, right? So what, what you see here is a component that renders a div, which has a color of blue if the primary property is set, and a color of red if the primary property isn't set. And suddenly, you could, you could do whatever you wanted in your CSS, really, depending on the properties, right? Which is something we needed for our button component. And so this is the story of where styled components comes from. That's what we eventually called this library that came from this week of bashing our head, head, heads against each other and messing with JavaScript. Um, the important point really is the big differentiator that made it different and to us easier to use was the removal of the mapping between styles and components. If you think about it, a class name is a mapping of a piece of styling to a DOM node. And it's a many-to-many -many mapping. Any DOM node can have many class names, and any class name can be applied on many DOM nodes. Right? So it's a many-of-many -many mapping between styles and components. But as a developer, when you're creating a component, the only time you ever use a class name is in that component, and then you reuse that component. If you have a button component, you only ever write that button class name once, and then you use that button component throughout your entire application. So if you have a mapping that used to be many-to-many -many, and still is to the DOM many-to-many, -many, but for the developer, it's really one-to-one, -one, why do you have that mapping at all? Right? There's no need to have a mapping that's one-to-one. -one. You can just bind them together. So this is what styled components looks like today. Um, you import styled from styled components, and then you say const title equals styled.h1, and then attack template literal. Now this styled.h1 call generates a component that renders an h1 DOM tag. And that h1 DOM tag has a class name that has these styles applied. So in this case, our title component will have a font size of 1.5 em, will be aligned to the center, and will have a color of pale violet red. And then we have a second component here, which is a wrapper component, which renders a section tag that's 100% that's width and height, has some padding, is, and ha has a papaya whip background. Um, these are React components in this case, right? So these React components I can just take and use like any other React component. If you've ever used React, these can be used like any other React component you've ever seen, right? You just write wrapper and title in your JSX. And when you look at this in your browser, you get a section that has a papaya with background and is width and height 100%, and a title that's centered and has a color of pale violet red. So here we've really remove the mapping for developers between styling and components. And instead of reusing class names throughout your application, you're reusing components throughout your application. As you could see, you can write actual CSS. And I mean actual, actual CSS, right? This string that you pass us is taken, parsed, and then injected into a style tag in the head of the DOM. That means whatever CSS feature you want to use, you can use. It's just CSS. There's nothing special about it, right? You're still just using CSS. So you could have a color changer component, right, that by default has a background of papaya whip and a heading inside has a color of pale violet red. 
And then above a certain width, with a media query, you have a background of medium sea green, and the H2 has instead a color of papyri. Now, there's, this is not some hack or anything. This is actual CSS, and you can write whatever CSS you want. If we open this color changer component in our browser and we resize the browser, what, you see it, what you'll see is that it changes color. Ooh, CSS media queries, yay. <laughs> I know we've all seen this before, but the point here is really that it's actual CSS. Whatever CSS you know, you can use. We don't restrict anything. We don't have to restrict anything because it's just CSS, right? There's nothing special about it. It's the CSS you know and love. And then comes the adapting based on props part, right? As I said, we had this button component earlier, where you have a normal button and you want to have a primary button in this case, right? You want to have a standard button and then a more important button for the important buttons, whatever that means. Um, and with style components, I can do that, right? I can change my background color and my color based on the property that is passed to the component. So in this case, our button will have a background of pale, pale violet red and the color of white if it's primary. And, a color, and then it's inverted if it's not primary, right? So if we render a primary button and a normal button, what that looks like in the browser is that you have a normal button and a primary button. Who would have thought, you know? But it's important because this allows us to create API, um, component APIs that are very natural to React, at least in this case. Um, Passing a primary prop to button is pretty standard, right? And as the user of, a, of the component, again, I don't have to care what that button does when I say it's primary or when I say it's not primary. I don't have to care at all. In this case, it's using styled components function interpolations to change the styling a bit. But it could just as well do any number of other things, right? And then came our sort of last big feature that we wanted to add, which is theming. Um, and we realized that we could do theming based on React's context feature. Um, so if you've ever used Redux, Redux passes state through the component context. And when you connect the component, that connection takes your theme from the context and injects it into the component. We do the exact same thing, except rather than providing you state, we provide you with a theme. So you can import this theme provider component. And you can define your theme, and that can be anything you want, right? It doesn't matter what that theme says. That's totally up to you. You have full freedom there. In our case, we're just going to say that our primary color is pale violet red. And then you wrap either your entire app or smaller parts of your app in a theme provider that provides the app with that theme. And then in our button, what we can do is we can say, we want our background to be whatever the primary theme color is, right? Makes sense. We're just taking that from the props, saying props.theme.primary. Whatever theme is, pro is provided to the button, that will be its background color. So when we look at this in the browser, of course, it's going to have a pale violet red background color because that's our primary color in our theme. But then you can also have multiple themes, right? Let's say you have a sidebar and a main app, and you want them to look different. So in our case, we're going to have a red theme and a blue theme that, for some reason, makes things green. I just realized that I should say green theme. Um, so we have a green theme and a red theme. Ignore that that says blue. And then we're going to wrap different parts of our app in different themes, right? So one part of our app will be in the red theme, and one part of our app will be in the blue theme. And then when we render that button, those two buttons, in the browser, you'll see that one is red and one is green. Again, this is not like mind-bendingly awesome, but if you think about the implication, my button declaration didn't have to change at all. I didn't have to tell my button manually that, hey, you're in a green area. You're in a red area. Change your color. No, it just happens automatically depending on where that button is rendered, right? This works because it uses um, React context feature. This works as many levels of components deep as you want, right? You could have a div and another component and another div and another component, and you can have as many layers of components as you want, and that button will still be red if there's somewhere up the tree a red theme provider. And this really meant that people could reskin our components at moments notice, right? Whenever they needed it, if they wanted to have a dark theme for their entire app, they just swap their theme out and that's it. And it'll automatically re-render with a new theme. Now, usually at this point, people say, well, that's cool, Max, um, but why do you hate CSS? And I think people must understand the purpose of styled components or 
all this exploration around CSS in JS in general, right? Because um, CSS is a great language. I, I love CSS. It's an extremely hard problem. There's this great quote by a man named Keith who quoted when he, who said, when you code CSS, you're writing abstract rules to take unknown content and organize it in an unknown medium. That shit is hard. CSS solves an extremely hard problem in an extremely elegant way. In, in, for Spectrum, for example, users, we let users post posts, right? And they can write comments to those posts. So it's a very standard thing. But if you even think about what, how many different things could people write in those posts and in those comments, there's infinite combinations of characters and emojis and images that they could put into those posts and comments. And yet, I just have to write five lines of CSS and it'll all look good, hopefully. And also, that same content can be rendered on I don't know how many millions of different of devices we have by now. How many different laptops and mobile phones and watches and what have you that websites are rendered on, right? This problem is an extremely hard one. Take arbitrary content in an arbitrary medium and make it look good. That's an extremely hard problem and CSS solves it extremely well. And style components isn't meant to say, hey, CSS is shit, we're going to do this better. Not at all, right? All we're doing is taking CSS and making it work even better for our use case, right? Which for us was a component system. We needed CSS to work well in a component system and we wanted to take the overhead out for human developers, right? We didn't want our developers to have to worry about which specific class name is used where and to avoid naming collisions and all of that. We just wanted our developers to be able to write their components, have it themable and have it easily be shareable on NPM. And that's really where style components comes from. It's not trying to replace CSS, it's trying to enhance it and make it work for our use case. Thank you very much. That's it. That's all I've got today. But I've also got a ton of stickers, which I put on the slides, so I don't forget to say that. Um, <laughs> so if you want stickers, just come find, come find me afterwards, and I'll give you some. Thank you.